Welcome. We have gathered here today with heavy hearts because we are facing times of great hardship and we are here to remember our dead. With that in mind, I would request that those of you who are here to police or report on this event, please do so with the utmost respect because this is a memorial service. We as disabled people are suffering. We're a fair-minded and accepting people, and yet it feels like a war has been declared upon us. The financial industry, who have created this economic crisis, and who have huge influence over our governments, are attempting to divert attention away from their culpability by trying to blame poor, sick, and disabled people instead. Amen. We all feel the huge injustice of this, but we are not alone. More and more people can see the injustice and the obscenity of demonizing the sick and disabled in order to make them pay for the mistakes and the crimes of the banking industry and the decision by our public servants to bail them out. Now where does Atos fit into all this? Atos is a private company, originally an IT company from France, which is now paid £110 million of taxpayers' money every year in order to remove benefits from sick and disabled people. Those of you who watch Channel 4's dispatches will know that undercover filming within offices of Atos has revealed what we all suspected, that the staff of Atos work to fulfil preset targets in order to remove benefits from seven out of eight claimants, regardless of the person's need or condition. When government tells us that welfare reform is about reforming fraud from the system, we now know that this is a lie. It is about targets and saving money regardless of the impact upon people's lives. It is about dismantling the welfare system that we have all paid into and most of us will need to depend upon at some stage in our lives. The undercoming filming also revealed that some Atos staff think they will not be held accountable for the mistakes and inaccuracies when removing benefits from those in genuine need and therefore they can absolve themselves of all blame. This callous, self-serving attitude is appalling. No job is worth destroying your peace of mind, integrity, compassion and humanity for. Whilst Atos did not devise the government policies, it does not absolve them of responsibility. They are still the foot soldiers that are implementing this cruel and unfair regime. Now, we will begin the memorial ceremony. Thank you. There is a great injustice taking place in our land. Sick and disabled people are being targeted and forced to pay for a crisis they did not create. Some are paying with their lives. So today we will remember them, our beloved dead, these who have fallen in the war against us. It is of great sadness to us that Athos are making so many mistakes and causing so much distress. During a nine month period, at least 1,100 people have died shortly after being assessed by Athos and found fit for work. That is the equivalent of 32 people a week. The last weeks of their lives must have been so traumatic, having to cope with being so ill and yet also having to face the distressing prospect of losing their income and being forced into seeking work in the collapsing job market. We also remember the people who have died during or shortly after going through the lengthy and stressful appeal process. So many have fallen during this campaign against us. Today, we remember them all. We will now read out the names of some of the fallen. 
where Atos assessments and loss of benefits have been a contributory factor to the distress that led to their deaths. We fear that there may be many more who have perished this way, but we can only name those who a coroner, who a coroner has recorded that the removal of benefits was a contributing factor to their deaths, or those where the families have publicly stated that the actions of Atos greatly distressed their loved ones before they died. We will now read out the names of those who have perished. He was an acclaimed Scottish writer, talented musician and a devoted follower of Hibernian FC. His friends described him as an absolutely brilliant pal and an out-and-out -out funny bloke. Paul took his own life. He did not leave a suicide note, but laying out on a table close to his body were two letters from the DWP, Department of Work and Pensions. One letter notifying him that his incapacity benefit had been stopped, and the other saying that his housing benefit had been stopped. His friends wrote a strongly worded letter to Chancellor George Osborne so that he would know the human cost of attacking those on benefits. Paula Wilcoxon was only 33 when he was found dead in Holland's Wood, Lindhurst. Atos had incorrectly assessed him as fit to work, stopped his ESA benefit and told him to find work. He left a suicide note and a letter to his family in which he expressed concerns about losing his benefits and the government's cuts. Leanne Chambers was only 30 years old when she died. She's worked as a sales coordinator in the past, but had been battling with depression for a number of years. Her condition worsened after she received a letter from Atos pressuring her to attend a WCA to see if she was fit for work. That night, Leanne walked out of her home sometime after midnight when her partner was asleep. A search was launched after he woke and found her missing. Her coat and purse were found beside the river Ware, and later the police recovered her body from the river. Elaine Christian was 57 and had worked in a bakery, but was forced to leave work because of spiring health problems. Her colleagues at the bakery described her as a cheerful, hard-working and trusted member of staff. Elaine had been very worried about attending a medical appointment with Atos to assess her for work. Mr. Christian woke up to find his wife of 28 years missing. In the kitchen, he discovered a suicide note, empty packets of painkillers and pools of blood. After a police search, Elaine's body was retrieved from a nearby waterway. She tried to cut her wrists 10 times, taking an overdose, but had died of drowning. Her husband said, she was worried about the assessment, but does not want to complain. Her manager from the bakery said she was one of the nicest people I knew and had a heart of gold. Her name was totally trustworthy. George from Chesterfield in Derbyshire worked all his life, first as a miner and a foundry worker, then as a communications engineer, until a heart attack in 2006 when he was 53. George tried to go self-employed, but his doctor told him to stop work and George applied for ESA. George was then assessed by Atos. During his work capability test, they noted that he had angina, heart disease and chest pain, even when resting. At first, George was found fit for work and put on job seekers allowance. He appealed. And after waiting eight months, he was put into the work group and had to start doing work activities. A few months after this decision, George collapsed and died of a heart attack, the very day before another Atos medical. His widow is convinced that the stress of trying to claim benefits through the adult system killed him. David Groves was a father of two and his grieving family said that he was killed by the stress of facing Atos and the stressful medical tests. He had claimed incapacity benefit for three years because his doctor had ordered him to stop working after having a heart attack and a stroke. David was greatly affected by being lumped in with the dull scrounges and benefit cheats when Ian Duncan Smith ordered a crackdown on sponges. David had already won one appeal to keep his incapacity benefit, but when Atos called him for yet another test, he became very upset. His wife Sandra said, 
when the government said they were going to get all those benefit sheets and Dave was called ready for a medical, he felt he was back to square one. It built up. He was in a terrible state the day he died. It was the stress that killed him, I'm sure. David was 56 and died of a massive heart attack the night before his Atos medical. His son said he could hardly walk any distance without needing help from some for his angina spray. I don't know why they could not have just asked the consultants who would have told them that his heart was too weak, even to have an elbow operation that he needed. They would have made it clear how ill he was. Mark and Helen Mullins, many of you may know Mark and Helen's story, you would have seen the video of them being interviewed outside a food bank. The married couple had been having a real struggle getting access to the correct benefits that they needed. The local authority removed Helen's 12-year-old daughter from her because Helen had learning difficulties and the daughter was having to look after her. She was not able to claim job, job seekers allowance because she was told she was not fit for work. However, they had real problems trying to obtain disability living allowance because she had an invisible disability, a brain disability. At the time of the interview, they were su surviving hand-to-mouth and walked 10 miles to go to a food bank each week to get enough food for them to survive on. They had no fridge or cooker and lived in only one room to keep as warm as they could because they couldn't afford to heat their home. They survived on stew that they cooked on a one room gas burner. In the end, the appeals and reassessments for benefits wore them down. The struggle to survive and carrying on fighting became too much for them both. They made a suicide pact and were found lying side by side in their home. Uncle, now we only know about this man because his nephew spoke of his death at the protest outside Atos headquarters. A young man, nervous and clearly not accustomed to addressing rallies, took the microphone to explain how his uncle, who had severe mental health problems, had been assessed by Atos and had been found fit for work and given zero points. His uncle was dismayed to find his benefit claim rejected. He then appealed against the decision and won at tribunal. But shortly after that decision, he was called in again for another assessment. For a second time, Atos found him fit for work, gave him zero points, and told him he did not qualify for benefit. He then began appealing against the decision again. Sadly, a few days before another tribunal date was set, he hanged himself. Tuvalar Widow. This, this lady's husband, this lady's husband, had been diagnosed with a heart condition and depression by his GP. He started claiming ESA. He was then assessed by Atos, who scored him zero points. His case review was unsuccessful. He could have gone to appeal, but his condition prevented him from progressing this. He felt that he was being handed to go back to work before he was ready. Allegedly, allegedly, the DWP took the unusual step of writing to his GP to stop them from issuing sick certificates. Sadly, her husband found the stress of being denied benefits and the continual pressure of being forced to find work when he was ill too much. He committed suicide. His widow is considering suing Atos and the DWP for corporate manslaughter. She believed that they ignored his mental health issues completely. Little sister. Now this lady, a bright independent professional, became very ill due to, due to psychosis and bipolar disorder, a life-threatening mental health condition. Little sister lost her job because of her health problems and then had to make a claim for ESA. Dealing with benefit claims, assessments and appeals when suffering from a mental health problem causes great anxiety, stress and anguish. Atos found little sister fit for work. However, she appealed against the decision. Now, whilst waiting for appeal to come through, little sister became increasingly paranoid and reclusive. She confined herself to a home and survived on wheat of and water. She was unable to afford to, to, to heat her home and the water pipe was broken. Occasionally, little sister had to attend a job centre because she had been found fit for work and was pressured to look for a job. The job centre did not seem to have, uh, have been aware of the gravity of her illness and refused to believe that little sister was too ill for work. A little sister's family had become unable to, unable to find her, so, but when they did, they ensured she got the appropriate medication from the doctor and tried to help her with food and other support. 
However, due to the nature of her illness, little sister became frightened even of her own family and refused all help. She got the police to caution them, preventing them from helping her further. One autumn day, little sister boarded a plane to Portugal. Her family received a phone call from the Foreign Office in Portugal, telling them that she had taken an overdose and then jumped from the hotel balcony. Little sister was only 32 when she died. This sad story, like so many others, show how inappropriate it is to expect those with mental health conditions to navigate their way through such an uncaring, unprofessional and incompetent system. Assessment by computer program and pressure from job centres is the last thing people with mental health conditions need. How can the government and adults get this so wrong? Stephen Hill, a dad of two, suffered from heart problems for about two years and was awaiting major heart surgery. He was given a 10 minute examination by Atos and declared fit for work. A month later he died of a heart attack. Mr Hill's brother said, I think the worry put so much pressure on him. For people who are really ill, like Stephen was, the system is wrong. We want to see it changed, so a report from a GP and a specialist should be good enough. Stephen should have been enjoying time with his grandchildren. For this to happen was just terrible. Sandra Williams suffered from painful degenerative spinal condition and depression. Atos had found her fit for work. In the days leading up to her death, she'd been very worried about losing her incapacity benefit. Sandra took a massive overdose. She was discovered by her son Ryan when he returned home with her husband. Craig Monk had an accident four years ago which left him needing a leg amputation. His family described Craig as vulnerable because he'd previously taken overdoses of antidepressants and painkillers. Atos found Craig fit for work. Craig's neighbour said he'd been worried because his benefits had been cut. Craig hung himself in his home and was discovered by his neighbour. Martin Ross was suffering from a treatment-resistant form of schizophrenia. His mother described him as a very placid, very caring person and added that he'd attempted suicide before because he feared being a burden. An adult assessment meant that he had to return to work and the prospect of having to take a job before he felt ready, power pressure upon him and he became extremely worried about it. Martin, who was only 36, committed suicide, leaving a note saying, to those I love, I'm sorry. Goodbye. Paul Turner, a dad of one, was medically retired from his job as a stores manager after he suffered a heart attack. He later had to undergo a double bypass because of the condition. He continued to suffer from angina. He was claiming an incapacity benefit until Atos found him fit for work and stopped it. However, he had a serious heart condition and died of heart failure weeks later. His family said, We believe the claim, the claim he was fit to work brought on his death. He was very upset and worried that he would fail any medical given him by a potential employer. Paul was also upset because he thought the officials believed he was a fraud who should not have been claiming benefits in the first place. His family also say that during his assessment, they did not undergo any physical test that could have picked up a problem with his heart. Mark Scott had suffered from oxygen deprivation when he was born, and this had left him prone to epileptic fits and panic attacks. This severe anxiety led him to drink heavily, and he became a chronic alcoholic. He was left penniless after Atos found him fit for work, and he was stripped of his incapacity benefit and housing benefit. His dad, Cliff, said that Mark sank into a deep depression after he lost his benefits. A month after work, Mark, who was 46, developed pneumonia and died. Cliff said, I think the anxiety Mark suffered over this depression killed him, or over this decision killed him. They should never have stopped his benefits. They pulled the rug from under him, and I think the stress of it led to his death. I want to fight for just justice, not just for Mark, but for all the other people in the same situation. Cliff took the DWP to an independent tribunal who found that the decision to remove Mark's benefits was incorrect. Cliff said, I know Mark will still be alive today if he had kept his benefits as it proved he should have. The government, the DWP, failed my son. The system is not fit for purpose. Now may, many, many of you may have known Karen Sherlock. She was a very active uh, lady online. Her Twitter profile was chronic spoonie, lots wrong, 
ESA is stopped by this inhumane government. Preparing for dialysis, each day is tough. After Karen died, Sue Marsh wrote the following about her in her blog. Karen embodied our fight in almost every way. She was desperately ill. Her kidneys were failing, putting a huge strain on her body. Ultimately, it seems she died of a cardiac arrest. She found she did found capable of work by the DWP, placed in the works related activity group. Her employment to support allowance was time limited to one year after the welfare reform bill went through. Not only that, but it was limited retrospectively, meaning that she only had a few months left to appeal for long-term support and support group before she lost everything. She was terrified, beside herself with fear. She lived her last months desperately scared that her family would not survive the onslaught it faced. She was the most vulnerable, whatever that is. The system failed her, and she spent her last precious moments in this world fighting for herself, for her family, and for others. She was one of us. She was Spartacus. And now she's dead, and she died in fear, because the system failed her, because cruel men refused to listen, and powerful men refused to act. She spent her last months fighting for the security of 96 pounds a week, and the reassurance that it couldn't be taken away. When she won her battle, she was finally put into the support group, after months of unbearable stress, resilient commitment and endurance beyond comprehension, she won her battle. But she lost her war. And we must all make sure that whatever comes, we win the war in her name. And in the names of many thousands more fighting for life and dignity. R.I.P. Karen, we won't forget you. We see the great injustice done to you. We recognise your pain and your struggle. We are sad that you had to pay the ultimate price because of this great injustice wrought against you. We honour you with our tears.